Yeah, so I've been waiting to ask you this for like, I don't know, 15 years or something. The whole remaking Vince Neil, I kept waiting for that part to get to the in the book. You don't bring it up. So, because that was a big thing for me. It was the first time I got to see your face. I read, read your name and all the liner notes of albums. And then you show your face. So what happened with that whole thing? Because that's, I feel like the song promised me, which was brilliant. It never came out. I know. I mean, I just did it for the, for the show. And, you know, uh, Rick Beato and I wrote and produced a song together. And it, it turned out so good, right? But, you know, who knows where he was at with Motley Crue at the time. And, you know, were they going to get back together, tour, uh, be a solo thing? I, I, I don't know. But the one very cute thing that happened was that um, his wife was so sweet. And she one of her things was she would rescue um, um, dogs. And uh, especially, you know, Cocker Spaniels. And um, we had one that had gotten very old. And, um, and so we also had moved to a small house with our children. And, you know, it was like there was no place in the yard for our kids to play with, you know, the dog and there were two other dogs and it was like crazy. So she took Sassy to Vegas and that Sassy who was already old was already, um, you know, kind of in her latter years. And she lit, you know, she, they showed us pictures. Of course, you know, she had a little place to sleep that had like, like tiger print and, you know, like with her name on the basket and like she had it made, you know, it's like, I wish she, they had adopted me. You know, and so that's pretty funny that, uh, you know, Miss Neil adopted our dog. That <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah, because I, I thought they were saying that you guys were going to make a whole album. I saw an article about that and I was like, yeah, I wonder. I love the song. I think you, people can get it illegally, but it never even came out on like iTunes. It's, it's really bizarre. Really? Oh, yeah. I, I got to talk to Rick about that. He's smart about all these things. So. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going to be interviewed by him for his podcast soon. Oh so, yeah, he's got a huge show on YouTube. You know, so I haven't seen him since that session. Oh okay. And then the other yeah. thing I was going to ask you. So I read the book, loved it. People definitely should get a copy. I think I have a physical copy coming, but I read it digitally. But the part um, that I was so confused about and so intrigued about too was this David Lee Roth and Van Halen thing. So it's like two things. Like first, you're supposed to write with David Lee Roth. And he shows up with these strippers, which is just weird. But then you said you never wrote with him. But then right. a few months later, you're supposed to write with Van Halen and that he shows up. So I'm confused. Right. Was, like the, to bust it all up. Band? Was, was, it, he, was Head or was their singer? I don't know what it was. It was like maybe Haggard left and now they were looking for a new lead singer. And I was recommending Mitch Malloy, who is a great rock singer, you know, and, and I thought he could pull it off. And, you know, he had the golden locks and all that stuff. Um, and so I went up there and he shows up, you know, top down, you know, looking it like look like a video shoot, you know, and then he gets out of the car. And then before you know it, like. No mutant, no song was started, and then I had to leave. And you know, it was like I never got asked back. It was, you know, he came in there and just like busted it all up. But that was so that's the one with Van Halen, the session with Van Halen, yeah, yeah. So, what and happened then, with the first one with just him? Why did you guys not write he, anything? He, he didn't come back, he didn't come back. Maybe he oh. didn't think I, you know, it's maybe I didn't enjoy the, the, the girl strippers enough. For his taste <laughs> Did you i was know? like in, i was like in shock they were like completely nude you know doing split beavers you know on on this like little office that i had i mean there was like it was like just almost like a little closet you know but they show up in trench coats and fedoras and ran stiletto heels and then they had nothing on underneath and this is for a songwriting session. This, I mean, it's just well, so it was it was our first meeting, so okay. it was like he was going to like explain what his music was all about. So he get, he gives me a cassette. Said, "Well, put this in there," 
this is what I'm all about. And it was like, like real old fashioned stripper music, like, do, 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 do. And then all of a sudden they like, they were like waiting outside obviously. And so they slip in and then they start doing all these moves and everything. And then suddenly he turns off the music and they like jump up and they, they grab their coats and they say, give us a call if you want some more inspiration. <laughs> what? That's so, so then a few months later, you're supposed to do work with Van Halen. So how did he, did you ever figure out like, how did he find out about it and crash? No, no, I, somebody must have tipped him off from the inside, you know, or who knows, you know, like how people are say, oh yeah, you know, like we're writing with Desmond Child, we don't need you. You know, okay. <laughs> you know, who the hell knows how that, that transpired, but it, it's like the high schoolness of it all, you know? Right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. That's so, and it's it too was, bad because you would have made, a, you could have made amazing music with Van Halen. I could have, I should have, I would have. <laughs> what about just Sammy Hagar solo? Do you never, you never had a chance to work with him? So, no, okay. no, yeah. I, you know, it's like, you know, the, you know, your, your career has a lot of ups and downs and, you know, I was just, you know, we, I was just moving to LA, you know, after this, this is like 1990, 91. And I had, I had to reinvent myself because all of my, former connections were all like New York, you know, based. And so all of a sudden I was in a whole new place with these West Coast people and I was learning the ropes. Yeah, well, that is amazing. I was going to ask you about that because that is a very hard thing to do. When Nirvana came along, it's like anybody associated with 80s rock was like not cool anymore. And you found a way to be successful in the 80s in the 90s and you just kept like you know ricky martin and then Katy perry and kelly clarkson i mean you're still writing songs how did you continue to reinvent yourself and not get the stigma of oh that's the guy that wrote living on a prayer we don't want him well it's by delivering the goods and maybe it's also looks and charm <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i just um just found a way to stay you know, with today. And to me, the best way to do that is to stick with the story. What's the story? What does this person want to say? To me, style is like secondary. What, 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 what is the story here? And um, getting them to tell their story in a writing session is really important because then they're singing something that's authentic. And when people feel that it's real, they buy it. When they think they're just recreating their past glory and writing a worse song than their hit, that's deadly for a career. You see it, you know? It's like people have to, you know, keep going if they want to stay in the game. And I once saw a interview with Dolly Parton on Larry King. And I think she said, you know, it was so distinctly, I, I remember she says, I um, want to be an active participant in the entertainment industry. I mean, that was like, she had it very clear in her mind, an active participant. And I mean, he was saying, you know, at that time, which we, Larry King went off the air like a decade ago, whatever. Like, how do you stay in the business? Why do, you know, um, how does your career keep going? It was the same kind of question. And, and so I'm curious. I love the now. I, there are new artists that I would love to work with. And um, I just, um, you know, would love to be in the, you know, continue to be in the modern pop. I had a hit a couple of years ago with Ava Max, um, Kings and Queens. I work with Rock Mafia. We we did a song for with Zed called Beautiful Now, and that was a hit. And now we have a new song that um, is with Jojo Siwa, who's this incredible influencer. She was a Disney 
a child star. Then she went on Dancing with the Stars and she came out, um, you know, as a lesbian and she danced with a woman on Dancing with the Stars. And she has the most incredible face. I mean, just she looks like a Swiss milkmaid or something. It's like, <laughs> you know, like like creamy skin with these blue eyes, you know, and like, wow. And if you see her her YouTube videos of her dancing, you cannot believe. I said, now, when she gets her groove on and does touring with that kind of dancing, and if she has hits to, 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 to sing, she's going to be one of the biggest stars in the world. You know, just she will. She's got that kind of drive and she's great. She sings great. She dances great. She has a message. She's today, you know, she's so fresh. So I'm really excited about that. So we started writing some, we have like two other starts to present to her. And, you know, so it's like you never um, stop unless you're stopped, <laughs> unless you stop, you know. It's like, and I, and, and so they're a young production team. They're producing. I'm just a co-writer. And it's like, I leave it in their hands. They sell it. They make it happen. So, um, and by the way, the, the song that, that uh, JoJo's singing now is one that we started with Miley Cyrus. So Miley's on the song too. Wow. Yeah. So I'm hoping that uh, Miley jumps in the promotion, you know, to, to uh, get her song up there, you know, because it's her song. Absolutely. So, you know, so the 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 point is is that um, I love talent, and you know the thing is that I am running out of time a little bit. I just turned seventy, and so I'm like um, working on a Broadway musical. I have several, but I have one that's really close that we've been working on since uh, 2005. That's like 18 years, and now. We're ready to go full steam ahead. Backers auditions December 8th in New York City. And it's it's called Cuba Libre. And it's the true story of my family before and after the Cuban Revolution. And it's aftermath. And it's very dramatic, but it's also very sexy. And, and um, you know, it's just, it's got it. And, um, you know, the, the thing is, is that there's other things I want to do. I mean, I, I, I during this whole last seven years I've been writing this book and finally it was time to release it because new things kept happening you know yeah. so it's like I couldn't stop the book right you know, I, I got a chance to work with my all-time idol Barbara Streisand and um, that had to go in the book and then I got asked to perform at the um, Odeon of Herodes Atticus in the Acropolis at the foot of the Parthenon and the um, it was the concert was called Desmond Child Rocks the Parthenon and Alice Cooper came, Bonnie Tyler came, Rita Wilson came, the Rasmus from Finland came, Kip Winger came, uh, Tabitha Fair, uh, Andreas Carlson, uh, um, Jesus, uh, Justin Ben Lolo, uh, Leo Dante, all these people came together. We had like 18 piece female, a string section, um, a band that was half Greek musicians, half American. It was like epic. And then at the end, 60 singers, you know, uh, half of them children, uh, walked around, you know, the, the stage all dressed in white, holding these golden orbs. And the the video mapping behind every song was different. And it was on the rocks. And it was like, I got to be a star for one night, you know, and and we filmed it all. And that's going to be the the kind of ticking clock of my career documentary. So I've been working on on getting a lot of uh, interviews with all the people that I've collaborated with, and they've been wonderful and um, funny, and especially you know irreverent ones with like John Stamos and stuff. And so, um, little by little, I'll have all the material I need to make a, like a great a great documentary. Oh, when is so, that coming out? Is that like that's no? I, I I don't have a deal or anything. I'm just okay. paying for it all myself, and you know because. I want to go to a company and say, look, you know, we need, you know, we have all this material. The movie's ready to go. All I need is the top editor. And, um, you know, we have a director that is filming all of this stuff. And, you know, I think that it, it's going to be very entertaining. But, you know, the thing is, it's like, like my book, 
is very my book is very personal and dramatic and that has to be part of it as well it can't be and then i did this and then i did that and then i had a hit song and then this and that i mean to me that would be deadly so i want it to be something that captures you know the you know half a century of being an immigrant uh, you know, even though I was born in the States, my mother was Cuban, grew up in the Cuban exile community. We grew up in the in the projects of Liberty City. My mom worked at Burger King. She was a songwriter. She never made it. And, um, you know, I, then I realized that I was more gay than I was bi. <laughs> and, um, you know, all of these things that I had to overcome um, really affected the music that I wrote, you know, really they were inter interlaced, even though I was collaborating with people for their records. There's a lot of me in those songs too. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, that's a good part of the book. It's I think like the first half is all about your story, which I find really fascinating. Even if you hadn't made it as a songwriter, I mean, your, your story is just so fascinating. So different from my life living on the West coast and everything. Um, so how do you deal with that with the success like what happens when you, you obviously had a lot of success, but what happens when you have a bad review or a song doesn't become a hit? How do you deal with that disappointment? Well, after, you know, having written, you know, over 4,000 songs and, you know, maybe fourth of them got recorded, found a place somewhere, you know, on an album track or something. And then of those 80 became top 40 in them. Those like, you know, 20 became top 20 and blah, 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 blah. you know, there is a, a lot of rejection, but you, you always kind of like, I'm always on to the next. And also when you write that song and when you finally go through the thing and then you think that it's going to be the next single and then all of a sudden you look at the records and even on the record, you know, I mean, it's so, uh, you know, that's what we live with. The rejection is. You have to you have to know that that's part of it. It can't stop you. It's like okay, well, I'll find a movie to put that in. I'll I'll find somebody else to sing it. I'll I'll you know I'll find a way. Um, step over the body and you keep fighting on. You you, yeah. you fall you you fail forwards. Right. Well, one of the <laughs> ones that was so fascinating to me. I mean, it's just comical. The story you tell about you're supposed to work work with Michael Jackson. And, and you call him and I mean, this sounds like a bad sitcom. You said that he did like a different voice and pretended to be his assistant, but you knew it was him. And he said, oh, yeah. Michael can't come to the uh, session. He, he's, he's canceling. Yeah, he's right. like, oh, Mr. Child, Mr. Jackson is very ill, very, very ill. You know, it's like, uh, well, uh, could you have his people call my people and reschedule our appointment? It's like, I knew it was him. It's like, I mean, it's, he's got one of the most distinctive voices of all time, right? right? Yeah. How do you can't, I mean, that's so bizarre. Why didn't you just have someone else answer the, it's so strange. And like, why did he hire you and then flake? It's just bizarre. You know, it, it, he was at that time when he had already lost Neverland and he had moved to Dubai and then he had moved back to New York and he was trying to make that epic album where he's like a big statue or something i i do you remember that it was yeah called, vaguely you know, yeah. i mean he just so like a dick like a dictator or something like that i mean yeah. uh and he had his kids with him and he had rented a a house um you know a townhouse off of fifth avenue uh near the pierre hotel or just around the corner and it was just it was he was not in a good place you know, and I think he was just, he seemed way more interested in Ricky Martin than me. Like, where does Ricky go on vacation? What music does he listen to? How is it that he was in Menudo and this and that? It was like, he was interviewing me like a, a journalist interviewing Ricky Martin himself, you know, like wanted to know all his secrets. And I thought, oh, well, does he, is he attracted to him? But then I later found out that he was a, a scholar of fame. You know, he made sure that he was best friends with, you know, Elizabeth Taylor and Brooke Shields 
and Catherine Hepburn and, you know, was trying really hard to become friends with uh, Princess Diana and trying to, you know, he loved fame and he wanted to know how people made it and how they stayed famous. He was obsessed with it. I mean, he married, you know, into, you know, he married Lisa Presley. Elvis Presley's daughter. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. So he was obsessed with it. And I think that, you know, it was way more about that, trying to collect, unravel the secret of what made Ricky Martin tick. That's interesting. But I mean, you've had so many run-ins yourself. There's a picture of you in the book that it's just, it fascinated me. It's you with Cher, Steven Tyler, and John Bon Jovi. What, tell me about that picture. Like, I'm like, what are you guys, the four of you talking about? What was the chemistry like? It that seems was, I was at the wax museum. I just put some statues together. <laughs> was that really what it was? No. Oh. We were backstage at Meadowlands. It was an Aerosmith uh, Guns N' Roses concert. I think it was Guns N' Roses. And um, Stephen, we still, Stephen was still like backstage. Maybe uh, Guns N' Roses was first, and they we, they were. It was like one of those where they always switch who's first and all that. Huh. And we were backstage, and and John was there, and um, Cher showed up. And because I had worked with all of them, it just like came together. And you know, Cher grabbed me by the hand and said, "Well, let's take a picture." And John, come over here, and and you know, Stephen kind of nuzzled into the picture. It was like. You know, wow. Like, who has a picture like that? I know. That's amazing. <laughs> that's like an amazing picture. That's pretty crazy. You must have a lot so, of those moments where you're just like, like, I mean, obviously, you talk about the book, the Barbara Streisand meeting her and all that. It was like a, a dream come true. I know. I've, I've been so um, lucky in my life that, you know, I, you have to have luck too, you know? It's not just charms and looks. Well, it's hustle is what you talk it's, about in the book about it's how hustle. Uh, it's hustle. Your mom, but your mom inspired you. She had the same hustle. She did. But I think on top of it at all, there's been so many coincidences and so many things that are so unlikely to happen that it's it's there's luck involved. Well, there's a thing too that's synchronicity. Which you talk, yeah. this is a really fascinating part of the book where you go to this, uh, was it a psychic or a healer or something? And you pick out this rock and it says joy. And then you meet a right. woman named joy. I right. mean, that's kind of like mind blowing in my opinion. Exactly. And then, then the, the egg donor that we picked out of the middle of the pile, you know, said joy on it. And yeah. so, it, and that was her like, like, um, incognito name that wasn't even her name and so it was sort of like that was confirmation that she was the one and of course you know we went through the whole pile but this one and uh, she was an actor uh she was in la she was 22 years old she was struggling um to make ends meet and also pay for acting and that touched my husband you know, who's an actor also and and she was so beautiful she looked a lot like my mom and kind of Curtis in a way. Um, and, uh, you know, she, she gave us the most beautiful children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a movie about that. I haven't watched it. I heard you talk about there's something on Amazon. It's a documentary of this. Yeah. It's called two T W O the story of Roman and Nero N Y R O Nero's named after Laura Nero. And, um, you know, who was one of my main, you know, idols and, and inspirations and, Towards the end of her life, we make friends. And um, so, um, you know, and he's always like, why, why'd you name me after a, a lesbian folk singer? And I, <laughs> I said, because Dylan was taken. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, guy, all these people that you've had on your bucket list to work with, is there anybody that you haven't worked with? I'm surprised because like Lady Gaga is one that I'm like, oh, I'd love to see what you two could come up with together. Yeah, I mean, Lady Gaga, Adele, uh, Troy Sivan. I mean, Jesus is 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 uh, his new song, "One of Your Girls," 
I mean, it's just the production on it and the video. Have you seen this? No. Which one? Oh, my. It's Troy Sivan. T R O Y E Sivan. S I V A N. Okay. Um, he wrote this song with his producer, and it's kind of um, part of the Max Martin theme. And he uh, is in the video, and you just have to watch it. I mean, it's so spectacular in the song itself and what it's saying and everything. I mean, it just blew me away. I just like, um, you know, Billie Eilish with her, you know, what was I made for? Oh, my God. Ah, I was so jealous when I heard that song, you know. So, I mean, there are people, you know, that I'd love to work with, but they somehow maybe they don't need me, you know, because maybe, you know, like they do what I do. Like I'd always wanted to work with Madonna. But she didn't need me because she's a real lyricist. She comes up with all her concepts. She writes all her melodies. And she works with, you know, programmer producers that come up with great tracks. And that's how she makes her music. And, um, you know, she didn't need me. So I'm I'm a person that comes in with concepts and, um, you know, envisioning, you know, like things like that. And when people have their own vision, they really don't need me. But it doesn't. It wouldn't hurt to have you there as a producer and a and a. And a I think I think it, I think it wouldn't hurt. But I can be, I I don't have to feel badly that I don't get into those rooms because that's that's sort of my chair, you know. Well, you know yeah, and then the, like explain the, to my audience the thing where um, and you talk about this in the book with dude looks like a lady. There's like three different recollections of the. You said Steven Tyler and Joe Perry's recollection is wrong because they said like, oh, the song was already written and he just changed two words. Yeah, that's what Steven said. And then Joe said the opposite. He said, well, Desmond came up with Dude Looks Like a Lady, which I didn't. Steven did. And then I finally got it correct. In, and, and, and also my collaborator, he had co-written Joe's autobiography. So he had been part of that wrong story also. So I set the record straight, which was that, you know, I walked in, Joe was uh, working on this backward loop and, and, you know, it was going like da 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 da. And then Steven, you know, brought me up and he said, what do you think of this? You know, I still hadn't said one word. I just had walked through the door. They had never met me before. It wasn't, hey, this is nothing. I said, what do you think of this? And uh, he started singing, cruising for the ladies, you know, da 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 da, cruising for the ladies. And I, and they said, what do you, th-? and then they stopped and they said, what do you think about that? And I said, I think that's really bad. <laughs> I don't, and then just like, you know, kind of poker face. And then I said, I don't think Van Halen would put that on the B side of their worst record, thinking I could get them to laugh. But, you know, Joe, like, crossed his arms and it's like his head was, like, way back and he's looking at me, you know, sl- with his slit through eyes, you know, just, like, looking at me. And he goes, and so then Stephen, you know, being more a people pleaser, said, well, originally I was singing Dude Looks Like a Lady. I said, what? Dude Looks Like a Lady? I said, that's a hit title. Let's write that song. And so uh, I said, how did you come up with that? And he said, well... I, I, you know, every everything boils back to Vince Neil, right? <laughs> uh, we had gone into a bar on the shore, and uh, us with the guys, you know, the crew, and uh, there was, you know, empty bar except for this, you know, vision of loveliness on at the end with a giant platinum mullet and black nails and porcelain skin and jewelry and curvy figure. And so, uh, you know, suddenly she turns around and it's Vince Neil of Motley Crue. And so then Steven said, ooh, that dude looks like a lady. Dude looks like a lady. Dude looks like a lady. And so he loves alliteration. And so, um, you know, but then I guess when, you know, he brought that, you know, everyone said, well, what does that mean? You know, and then then Joe said, well, we don't want to insult the gay community. And, and, you know, I, I said, I'm gay, not insulted. Let's write this. <laughs> and so, you know, I I pulled them into the story, the story, cruising to the bar on the shore. Her picture graced the grime on the door. Then Stephen came up with the next line that makes absolutely no sense, which is she was a long lost love at first bite. 
It was what like, would you have done instead of that? Because I know you said that you no, didn't like that in the book. No, it didn't make sense. It's like if he's just discovering that that she was a he, then how would he? How would it be a surprise? He just liked how that sounded. So it was a long you, lost love. Yeah. All those alliterations at first bite. What and would you like, have changed it to? What should it no, be? No, I thought it was like I threw my money down on the stage and he thought that was stupid, you know, like because it was a strict joint. So I threw I threw my money down on the stage, you know, and, you know, thinking of, you know, uh, that share song, Gypsies, Tramps and Thieves, you know, you know, they and all the men would come around, and throw the money down. Right. You know, yeah. so that was the imagery I had in my in my mind. And so uh, then, you know. Dude looks like a lady. And the, then the second verse goes, never judge a book by its cover or who you're going to love by your lover. You know, all that alliteration, right? But think about how advanced that concept was. Usually in a song like that, the guy runs the hell away, you know, when she pulls out her gun, tries to blow him away, right? Then you think, get me out of here, right? But no, he sings, my funky lady, I like it, like it, like it, like that. And he stays. It, 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 he stays because he liked what he saw. And that's why I want you to see this Troy Sivan uh, video. It's like you're going to freak. It's so good. One of your girls, that's what it's called. I'll and, have to watch that in the JoJo thing. I got I got some homework to do here. Oh, my God. You know, I, anyway, so... That how long ago was Dude Looks Like a Lady? That was 87? Yeah, I think so. 87. And how many years since then to now? Like 30 something? Yeah. More, right? 13 plus 23, uh 20, 36. Okay. Right? So now it's like uh, you know, trans this, trans that. It's all, you know, everybody's all in whipped up into a tizzy about, you know, non-binary, uh, you know, people, you know, are kind of like not wanting to be pinned down to one gender. Uh, and it's like, we were there, folks. We were there. And so, you know, they used it in Mrs. Doubtfire, you know, during the room dance. So, you know, it's like every little kid in the world knows that song, right? Yeah, but, it's a classic. But I have a funny story. Um, this worker that was working on our house, you know, comes in and he goes, You wrote that song by Aerosmith called Do a Naked Lady. <laughs> I said, Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to break his spell, you know. <laughs> I know. I think when I was a kid, I think I thought it was like do me like a lady or something. Like I didn't know what it meant because I, I was so little. I don't even think I saw it in print. So, <laughs> but it sounds good either way. Either way. Right. Want so then I I was um, recording uh, Stephen on a song called Red, White, and You uh, that had been written by one of my writers. Uh, Levi Hummond. And, um, you know, before he did the session, I called him into, you know, my part of the office. And I said, look, I want you to sit down and I want to tell you the story of, of the writing of Dude Looks Like a Lady. And so I told him exactly what I told you. And he just looked off in the distance and he, and he said, I think I like your story better. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> He totally made it up. Like he he tried to diminish me and all ba basically said I had a mustache. First of all, I never had a mustache on its own, not even in the 70s porn era did I sport a mustache <laughs> like during the yeah, Brady. Nothing in the book that shows that. I've never been a Ted Lasso, okay? And he makes it sound like I'm like Juan Valdez, you know, like with, with the handlebar mustache. And, you know, so tried to diminish my contribution. Like, that song would not be without me. And I also wrote more than just one word. I dragged them into that story. And I was coming up with, you know, never judge a book by its cover and all that kind of stuff. Right. And obviously, you know, it must have valued you because they kept having you back. And you wrote, you know, Angel and What It Takes. And 
I mean, right. that's takes you. Didn't they say that was their best song they ever wrote at that point? Yeah, I think so. I don't know, but uh, then you know, after you know, we the last songs we wrote together were um, "Hole in My Soul" and "Flesh" and "Ain't That a Bitch." They were on Nine Lives, I think. And that was oh, and then they they cut a uh, one called "Last Last Goodbye," I think. I think that that was right. something that we had started before a long okay. ago that it was like a stillborn. Then they kind of brought it back. Yeah. Um, and they tried, that's crazy how they tried to cut you out or not. They, sorry, not Aerosmith, but like their management or somebody tried to cut you out. And then Steven Tyler was like, no, he co-wrote these. Like we're putting his, giving his uh, credit. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it wasn't quite that. It was, it was another song. Uh, you know, but with another band that that happened with, but oh, was it? You know, okay. Yeah, it was a, yeah. There's so there yeah. was a few things like that in the book, like the story with Meatloaf was was crazy. Like the, I mean, the, it sounded like it was hell to work with him. Uh, no pun intended on that battle yeah. out of L three. That's that that was a crazy part of the the book. Yeah, very sad. Um, you know, and I, I I I mean, he was very rough on me, but I actually had a lot of affection for him at the same time. And felt felt sorry for him, you know. He seems so trapped, you know, inside of his persona. He couldn't just be, you know, normal. You know, it, it was like in the, in maybe in professional settings, he come in, came in like he was like you know King Kong busting out of out of out of, out of prison or something. You know, it was just like I remember once he was like kicking the everything down the baffle the mic stand everything and because he was frustrated with himself that he couldn't you know get it right you know and that kind of like very over the top um you know grand craziness and uh took nine months and uh bad out of hell three is actually a masterpiece it cost over two million dollars to make one of the most expensive records of all time and right now you can't get it on Spotify in the United States. He took it down, but he didn't own the global rights. So you can get it everywhere else in the world. And, you know, it, the shame of it is that, you know, they made me record seven Jim Steinman songs that had been on other things like it's all coming back to me now and behind the scenes, cause they were in a lawsuit together behind the scenes. I was playing Jim, the songs, you know, the, the rough, uh, mixes and everything. I wanted to get his blessing, and he he loved everything. But I never got to tell Meatloaf about that. You know that I you know I made sure that Jim loved it, and so the fans are missing out on on something that was blessed by Jim Steinman that were his songs, and it was Meatloaf singing it. And you know, Bad Out of Hell Three did exist; it really exists. And then they made a record together. It was the last thing they did together. And to me, that's the coda of the trilogy, the the, the last record that they made. And, you know, he, you know, he, you know, that he passed away, you know, and Jim first, you know, passed away and then me followed him, you know, and, um, you know, that was like truly the most remarkable duo ever, you know, the two of them. So because, you know, I was such a fan from the beginning, just to get the opportunity to to produce the Bad Out of Hell 3 was the biggest thing in my life, you know. And everybody told me, don't do it. Everybody, everybody I work with said, don't do it. He's going to destroy you. Uh, you. Don't do it. Why are you doing it? Don't do it. But I was so stubborn. I, I went through with it and he... You know, in the end, he stiffed me on my back end, $65,000. And there was, you know, it wasn't worth trying to sue for it. Um, and he didn't put my name on the back of the cover, uh, which was in my contract. And my name was teeny, teeny, tiny. Uh, and then they made it seem, you know, if you open the cover, dedicated to Jim Steinman in big letters with a beautiful thing to Jim, who he was in a, $30 million lawsuit hmm. with crazy over, over the brand name bad out of hell. Cause Jim wanted to make a musical called bad out of hell. 
And that, and uh, Meatloaf didn't want it. He says, no, those are the names of my albums. But yeah, but I wrote those words. You know, it's and those are my songs that I solely wrote. I want to put them all in a, in a musical. And uh, that went, I don't know if it ever really got to court, but it was protracted. It cost millions of dollars to litigate. And eventually, I guess they settled. But that was after Bad Out of Hell 3 was out. Yeah. So, Is that kind of you know, nice that you don't have to deal with that? Um, I mean, you obviously you've worked with Diane Warren and you've, you've worked with some of the same people over and over, but you don't have like someone that you're uh, partners with necessarily. You just go from free project to free project. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I love it. You know, I love that every situation has a different dynamic and uh, we have different chemistry. You know, when I write with John Bon Jovi and Richie Sambora, there's a, you know, we actually wrote this song called Blood on Blood, which was about three best friends. And, you know, to me, that was about us. And maybe not to them, but to me, it was about our our trio. Well, and yeah. With, Sorry, uh, Steve, with Stephen and Joe, um, you know, writing with Alice Cooper, uh, writing Trash. I mean, that was a great education for me about writing for a character. Um, and, you know, what that character could sing, what they can't sing, and also the morality of it. You know, always, you know, the bad boy gets punished. Yeah. Well, you said you know, Bon Jovi. I was going to ask you about these days. Do you remember that the writing sessions for that album? Because I feel like that was kind of an underrated album. I know it came out during that grunge time, but it it did kind of well. I really liked the song, Something for the Pain. I really, I thought that was such a catchy song. I know we wrote great songs, but really uh, MTV just snubbed, snubbed all of those bands. It was like it went from one decade to another. And there was like, you know, Smells Like Teen Spirit was the was the was the thing. And they, you know, it, it, everything about those two periods, it, it's so, so opposite. You know, these virtuosos of guitar, uh, you know, got traded out for guys that were art students that could play three chords that had hair in their face that looked down where, you know, the bands I was working with, they had, you know, puffed up chests, you know, looking up at the last row. And these guys had caved in chests. They're looking down the whole time. It was just like a complete, even physical posture. Uh, you know, the bands before had tight jeans, you know, with hot butts. And then these guys were like baggy old, you couldn't even see their bodies, you know, you know this you know, like work boots and, and flannel shirts and, you know, stringy hair in their face. I mean, and th they sang real kind of almost suicidal uh, sounding uh, songs about feeling like they were outcasts and losers and all this kind of stuff where... The previous generation was like about being winners, about hope and, you know, we'll make it, I swear. You know, it was complete, complete opposite. And I'm not sure why that happens, but the, the pendulum does swing. Like right now, we're going through a renaissance of all the music of the 80s, of the music that I was really involved with. So my um, performance rights, royalties, I've like, tripled quadrupled because that's awesome you know, it's it's been like out of nowhere all of a sudden it's like what these checks are going up i love What's the heat going? i love the you 80s know? that's my favorite era like it's interesting because the 80s was such a party era at drugs and booze and all that but like a lot of the artists you worked with had gotten sober by the time, like Alice Cooper and um, uh, Aerosmith and stuff. But were there artists that you worked with that were that was an issue? Because you don't talk about that much in the book, either with yourself or with artists that you worked with where drugs or booze got in the way of things. I, you know, really, I because I didn't partake in any of that because uh, I was more on the spiritual tip, whatever, meditation and yoga and all that. Um, and they were all like in their 12 step programs and all that. And they were really trying to pull it together and they did. And look at the kind of industry that they created by, you know, getting help with drugs and everything. But what about, um, um, you worked with Lindsay Lohan. Was she sober when you recorded with her? Yeah. Did oh, I she work was? with 
Wait, did I work with Lindsay Lohan? A song I Live for the Day? I don't know. It's on Wikipedia. It could be wrong. I Live for the Day. Or maybe uh, yeah, she covered that I, your she song? Covered, she covered it, but I didn't uh, work with her. You know, okay. uh, I, you know, the uh, song went out there, whatever. <clears throat> but um, I didn't know any, I didn't know her or any of that. But, you know, there were other people that, you know, did get in trouble um, with these things. And some of them, you know, didn't really survive it. That's so, the saddest thing. Yeah, I hate seeing yeah. that. You know, that whether the- whether it was actually dying or just being burnt out and just going away. You know? Right. What about um, you worked with you did a song with Sebastian Bach. I, I'm a big mm-hmm. fan of that era. Again, Sebastian Bach was one of my favorites growing up. What was it like working with him? Because he's kind of a character. He sure is. I mean, <laughs> I was I was promoting my my album Discipline, and I had gone to Toronto. I think he's Canadian, and uh, he was on the radio uh, when I was on my way into the radio station. So he was the interview before me, and he goes on there and he goes, you know, that Bon Jovi, you know, uh, this and that, like totally slagging Bon Jovi when you know. First of all, I think, you know, John had gone to high school with Snake, you know, and it was like right. John gave them the, the, the paid for their, their equipment, put them on the map, put them as the opening act as it was a loyalty thing. And for this brat, you know, to start slagging Bon Jovi, I was like, get there fast. You know, like, I'm going to kick that guy's ass. You know, and by the time I, you know, I walked out of like the elevator and he had walked in in the other elevator. I I wasn't able to catch him because I had to go on. But, you know, I did slag him, you know, for being such a brat. And so, um, you know, also I wasn't uh, happy that he wore that T-shirt that said AIDS kills fags. That's right. Yeah. That, That uh, you know, yeah. Talk about, you know. It's just being a brat. I don't even think that he put two and two together. But then, you know, many years later, he came to to Nashville to write with me. And we wrote a song. I think he changed the title of it, but it was called The Devil's Deja Vu. That's a cool title. Yeah, I think because he I think uh, on his record, he called it Falling Into You. That has no no texture or or color (laughs) or visuals. The Devil's Deja Vu. Doesn't that, that sound like... That sounds way cooler. I like it that. Sounds, it sounds like a movie title, right? Yeah. It's like a, some Matrix something, right? Somebody and, else should steal that title. That's a great title. Yeah, maybe I should rewrite that title with somebody else. Um, but um, he was telling me pretty wild stories about his time, you know, in... Uh, I think he was trying to prove that he wasn't homophobic, you know, because he went on Broadway in uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Right. And so he was telling me some wild, you know, stories that um, I don't know if they were real or not, but he was telling me some wild stories. Like with like other, like with what? What kind of stories can you say? Just like the, the stuff that was going on, you know, behind the scenes between the actors and the dancers and the this and the that, you know. Was he involved and, with it? I'm just telling you that he was telling me stories. I'm not saying that he partook in the stories he was telling, but they were pretty, you know, like, you know, they were pretty strong. (laughs) And, um, you know, he was really very, very colorful. And I actually enjoyed my, my writing session with him. And he was very funny. That's that's awesome. Well, I know you got to get going. I do have one last question because I feel like this is a very big issue. I think I've only heard you, heard you talk about it a little bit. AI. This AI scares the shit out of me. Does this scare you with AI writing songs or what do you think of that? Okay. Well, first of all, you know that I'm on the board of ASCAP and, you know, we're very concerned about it and have had a lot of um, meetings about it and, um, in, you know, like almost like it was almost like uh, being in a course right about it and we went to Washington uh, about a month and a half ago and we walked the halls and we're trying to explain it to people that don't 
barely can turn on their phone, you know, like these people uh, don't, aren't, they don't understand how music and technology and all of that mixes together. But this is what, 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 you know, we came to is that, you know, they, they had these companies came in and they, what they scraped all of Spotify, all of YouTube, any source of music, they put it into the jumble of what they are training on called training. And so the thing is, that they're saying, okay, well, it's all fair use. Well, but it isn't because they're charging a subscription to their services. So, I mean, I heard of, about a deal that went by that they sold, somebody sold their company for $80 billion, you know, to private equity, you know, that is doing this, all this AI stuff. And it's like, okay, really? How are they going to make their money back? And so I'm, you know, the thing is, is that these are the essentials that we need. We need, first of all, consent to use our material. Our, you know, it's, there, there's a thing called copyright, you know, that exists. And these things fall under copyright, uh, you know, infringement. Right, they took our stuff. They took our jobs. Right, um, they took our stuff, and then uh, no cons without consent. Then there's no credit, and then there's no compensation. So there's three big fees, no nos, because we should be. And what we don't want is for some um, politicians to come in and say, okay, let's create a compulsory rate. Okay, you guys, you can use anything you want and you you know just pay into a fund and we'll just distribute it amongst all the songwriters. It's like, no, we want, you know, willing buyer, willing seller. It's the basis of capitalism. You know, not all songs are worth the same. I know not all of my songs are worth the same. Right. So if you're going to use one of my money makers, I want credit for it. I want consent to say, yeah, you can use it. Like people are asking to interpolate my songs into their songs. Sometimes I allow it. Sometimes I don't. You know, because I don't I don't want to wash out my my original creation. The right. value well, of if it. They put in like living on a prayer and dude looks like a lady and all these songs and put it into a computer and then wrote a song based on that. You want to have the, the, the uh, ability to say, yes, you can do that or no, you can't. Yeah, right. much I want and, then, that. and then let's say, let's say I say, yeah, you can. Um, I want credit. Yeah. And Fair. I want to be compensated because my overhead is high. You know, there are a lot of slow years, no hits, but still, I have to pay the people that work for me and have to keep upgrading the Pro Tools because every so often there's another upgrade and you have to pay thousands of dollars for that. You have to, like every company, they have to keep upgrading their equipment and their facilities and all of that. But if you don't have a hit and the money isn't coming in, then you can't do that. Then you have to fire people. Yeah. Well, and then also think about the people that don't have as many hits as you. Maybe they only had one hit and now people are, are making money off that. That's eating away at their uh, livelihood. At their livelihood and their, and their kids, you know, being able to go to college and all, all of right. that. I mean, we are workers. You know, we're working people like anybody else. You know, yeah, there's superstars that would be fine. But that's not the working, you know, songwriters that I know. Like, we wait years between hits and hope for the best. And we keep going and showing up and working, you know, writing every day and hoping that we lock into the next magic situation with the right artist to sing it and all these things that have to, you know, be synced up, synchronicity, right? Right. So, so AI um, has the potential of destroying all of this and it's not fair because they're charging for it. 
and we don't get a piece of it. Yeah, it's not like tough. this is fair use, okay? Fair use, Mister Fair Use or Mrs. Fair Use, then make it free. If it's fair use, That's like public, point. like public domain. But guess what? Public domain, which I never have agreed with to begin with. You know, I think you know, ninety-five years later, it, whatever you wrote, whatever you did, belongs to the world, right? It belongs to you know, and your your grandkid, great grandkids, or whatever don't can't get any money from it anymore. It's over. Now, are do the Vanderbilts give back their mansions after they live in it for a hundred years? Well, yeah, and didn't they change the laws? Because I, th I think originally wasn't it like twenty or thirty years? were a character or something to be a public domain. And then Disney was the one that Disney uh, kids went in and fought and changed the law and made it whatever. I think, like you said, a hundred years or something. Well, it's, well, there's different things that reversion, you know, uh, copyright reversion is 37 years. Like, let's say I sold a song, then I get it back, but it doesn't come back really globally. It only comes back in the U S oh. and whoever bought it gets to keep it on a global basis there's no wow. before it wasn't that way it was 57 years and when the song came back it came back in its entirety right you know, yeah. globally global it's called global expression okay so, so now something you guys so are now, fighting, though it, with the uh, not necessarily with ascap because that's about um you know performance rights and things like that but, um, you know, there's all these different, you know, layers of people that are fighting for the rights, you know, copyright um, and, uh, you know, holding. Um, but AI demolishes all of that because it's like, well, you know, how close or how far is this thing you're going to make to my original song? And it's like retreat now that they've done it. How are they going to pull out? Like I say, oh, I'm, my hand up. You can't use any of my stuff. It's like pulling a drop of water out of the ocean. How are you going to do that? Hmm. So it's very scary. I mean, I, there was an article the other day in the New York Times that said uh, singularity uh, will happen in, uh, by 2031, which means that AI will have developed enough that it can be independent of our control. Oh God, this, that scares me. It's called the singularity. And so it's more than that because yeah, we can make a many, as many rules as we want in our country, but what about the global expression? What about global uh, trade agreements that are in line that, you know, where it all it's it's one agreed, um, you know, copyright. That 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 is a big part of what we're going to fight for with this AI, and you know we need the the representatives of of in Congress. It can't be political, you know, like that. Oh well, you know, the Democrats think one thing, the Republicans think another. No, this is about capitalism in our democracy. It's a partisan issue, yeah. I think I don't think it's, it's got because when we passed the Music Modernization Act. That passed a hundred percent in both houses, and Love then it. we were able to. But we fought like dogs, and everybody had to start agree. And then we were able to lift. You know, it's it's not perfect, and it's not what it's really worth. But we were able to lift our rates a little bit higher. You know, yeah. uh, and everybody worked very hard. You know, on that, and uh, but now this this is a whole new thing. Whole new thing, you know well, that 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 and and it's on every level. I mean, design, artwork, photography, uh, using people's photographs and collaging them into some, you know, surreal scape that you think is your art that then you sell but don't compensate the original photographer. A good point. And, and you know the actors now. I think they they work something out with the studios that they can't just use their faces and their voices 
to That's create, right. yeah. you know, new yeah, products. They were going to just use AI with these uh, actors and then basically make actors irrelevant. It's kind of scary. Yeah, it's coming. Yeah. It's coming. Hopefully but... we get the laws changed and all sorted out. And I'm glad that well, you're on the fight. Yeah, I'm 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 out I'm out there and I and you know I I walk the the halls with uh Pasek and Paul, you know, that wrote um uh The Great Showman and um Dear Evan Hansen and also Madison Love, one of the great new um independent songwriters that's writing on all these, you know, fantastic Dua Lipa's, you know, songs and all these things, and she's fantastic. And uh, we were there, you know, young and old. We were like trying to get the message through that that these people who we voted into office have to represent us and protect our rights and protect our livelihoods. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Is there anything else you want to promote here at the end? Obviously, the book is out now. People should get it. Like I said, I loved it. I read yes. The book. It was amazing. Follow me at Desmond.child on Instagram and all the news that's fit to print is there. I'm very aggressive on it and I love it. And I have a new skincare line that my friends created for me called VidaLocaSkinLife.com. And we're just doing a soft launch now. So it's, it's fun, you know, cause I always loved lotions and potions and I always <laughs> would sneak in and use my mom's creams and smell them and all this kind of stuff. So I I just love it. And um I'm working on my my musical Cuba Libre as well. That's you know, so lots of stuff coming out of the Desmond Child, you know, mega machine that's <laughs> yeah, happening. I look forward to the documentary and also these uh the music that you're working on now. That sounds really interesting. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Thank, All right. So Chuck, thank you so much for having me on your show. That was a blast. Come back anytime. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the full podcast episode. Please help support our guests by following them on social media and purchasing their products, whether it be a book, album, film, or other thing. And if you have a few extra dollars, please consider donating it to their favorite charity. If you want to support the show, you can like, share, and comment on this episode on social media and YouTube. And if you want to go the extra mile, you can give us a rating or review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts. Finally, make sure you're subscribed to the show on YouTube for the video versions and other exclusive content. We appreciate your support. Have a great rest of your day and shoot for the moon.